so uh, Victoria Luis uh, Schultz Duba, she's our moderator today. She is doing a PhD at the Princess Foundation on the Sublime. And it's not just for aesthetic reasons. So she is a painter and is really interested in art and the sublime and the romantic and emotion and passion. But it's also because she's very, very concerned about the environment. She's very concerned about durability. She's very concerned about, uh, I would say, neuroscience in a certain way, just that we again engage with our built environment emotionally and holistically. She has uh, quite an experienced practitioner. She's working uh, presently with Apollodorus Architecture, who uh, Mark Winston Jones is the, the, the director, and she will be there on day three. And uh, she thinks that architecture and society derive from our inseparable matters, and they uh, Considering our current global situation, we need to rethink both in a holistic and profound way. And here I will always show, so I introduce the panelists, I always show a little bit their work, which is our visit, is our, our business card. You know, you see that's her thesis project, it's um, um, quite a fascinating project. Uh, her painting, which kind of addresses nature in a very kind of intense moment. Then some uh, follies, uh, some um, uh, capricci, some work, but then also uh, like a project, a project uh, uh, which has been done at the summer school in Brussels this last summer, and a counter project for <coughs> Blaton in Brussels. Counter projects have really, I mean, I have been working on counter projects all my life, and I think it looks like it's uh, really one of the favorite activities. Then a drawing she did for a project at Apollodorus. For those who I do we see later also uh, on day three, you will see like a uh, digital image of it. And then uh, Frank uh, is an associate professor, Frank Martinez is an associate professor at the uh, University of Miami. He has a partnership with his, with his wife, so he's building and has uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful work, teaches design drawing and uh, lectures. Uh, Frank also, interestingly, is also associated with the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. So he has a really qualification to talk about architecture, classicism, but also about health and has a scientific, also a scientific foundation. Also interesting with uh, Frank is that drawing is absolutely essential. So, uh, so uh, as he mentions, uh, uh, architectural urban projects that contribute to that of making cities, but underlying the teaching and research is an exploration of drawing as a method for acquiring and developing architectural knowledge. And I think we cannot speak enough of the handcraft, so we will have many opportunities to talk about the craft, the handcraft, and we know that so much of what we see, which is messed up in our production and in our education, is that the computer, which is a fantastic tool, but has taken over at a level if it's kind of paralyzing imagination, it's paralyzing emotion, it is paralyzing quality. It's no longer leading to positive results. So here, obviously we have computer arts, we have hand drawings, we have picture spilt work, which is of absolutely highest standard. Like the teaching uh, Frank is doing is absolutely a high standard. I was teaching in Miami, I had Frank on every one of my review, he's the most inspiring teacher. Teacher I know, and we are teaching together in both Spain and Portugal summer schools. We have, teach, we have taught it together several several times. So more projects. Uh, Samantha Xinyan Chuang, uh, she was supposed to be here. She may be somewhere in the room or in the <coughs> she hasn't found her way. But she's a uh, graduate student at uh, Harvard, University of Harvard, and uh, she has an Italian, so she has an additional uh, research and uh, you know interest in Italian culture, speaks Italian really quite well. She introduced me also to uh, French literature. She introduced me to films when she was 18. So she was one of my mentors when I was teaching at Notre Dame. And I thought what really struck me in her statement is uh, she her interest in low tech urban and architecture design solutions that elegantly address the climate crisis. And also the importance of connecting landscape and urbanism to the countryside and the city, not to mix them, but really to kind of get a really good dialectical understanding. 
Another important thing is she mentioned, and I think it's something Leon uh, holds very dear to, is this idea that classicism is not uh, something which is concentrated only on the Western world. So it's something which uh, embraces and can be found in many high cultures in very different types of civilization. And one last thing, uh, which I think uh, she offers as a recommendation is this idea of otium, which was very important in uh, classical antiquity, this appreciation of mindful leisure that liberates the intellect from solely utilitarian practice. And this is something you find also in Asian culture. So in the Zen Buddhism, you find it's very, very similar. And autumn is in some way, it's like you not, it's in some way time not to do anything, but you do a lot of things while not doing it. Alejandro Garcia, uh, so uh, projects by, um, by, by uh, Sam, so uh, project in Rome, and then your thesis project, which kind of is a rec reconversion and a kind of, and an addition to an industrial building, which I think uh, will be very interesting also for one of the other panelists, Bushra Berber, who is also very interested in industrial architecture. But now Alejandro, a practicing architecture lecturer at the School of Architecture at Polytechnic University. He's also uh, very much involved with um, Inbau, uh, Spain, uh, offers a lot of classes, uh, uh, summer schools. And uh, what I think is remarkable uh, with what he does is uh, empowering uh, the craftsmen. So he has a lot of connection with craftsmen and he gives prices to craftsmen. The, so the tree house, uh, with, by the means of tree house, he can offer every year a relatively remarkable price for craftsmanship and it, it kind of really is incredibly um, um, impactful. Has a website, he does a lot of dissemination, a lot of education, a lot of uh, promotion of the interest and principle of traditional architecture, all in Spain and Portugal, but also in, at an international level. Publication, so there's a new journal. If you haven't seen it, you should absolutely look at it. It's free, you, it's online, but you can also get a printed copy journal of traditional building. It's a peer-reviewed journal of higher standard that you know that when you write about classicism or traditional architecture, you don't find any journal who will publish you, but this is the journal for you. You can publish essays and your project in this fantastic journal. And then of Terra Shida, they do this rehabilitation of an oasis in Southern Morocco, and they recently got a major award by uh, Philippe Rottier uh, in Brussels to, to just uh, reward this uh, effort. Objectives promoting traditional building crafts and knowledge, educating traditional building architect urbanism and preserving the richness, richness of the world's building cultures are instrumental for the future of human civilization. Bushra Berba, I hope she's around now. Uh, so Bushra is an architect uh, based in London. She graduated with a distinction in, uh, in architect urbanism from Manchester. And she was as an has worked at research, research associate and presently doing also a PhD in London Bartlett School of Architecture. And uh, here are some of her projects. And um, Bushra is particularly interested in the uh, industrial heritage and preservation and reconversion. And she likes this type of architecture because, because it's solid, it's durable, and it has a great amount of flexibility and it helps also to consolidate the identity of cities so rather than just dumping everything. Now, Edward Pat from China, in China, he founded in China, was a student of German literature, and he, he found the ugliness surrounding him so uh, unbearable that he kind of started self-teaching himself in classical architecture, and he came to quite a level of expertise, does now counter project, this is his uh, counter project for the two Blatois in Brussels, some the model building and some really exquisite little entrance gate. And, and so really, it's so amazing to see young professionals being self-taught because that's what Leo and myself and many people, Frank, most of us are self-taught because there was no school teaching classicism and it's kind of really great that there are young people doing it again. But fortunately, there are people like Tim Smith who is teaching now a successful uh, uh, studio with uh, his uh, partner, Jonathan Taylor, at Kingston University. So they have their little niche. 
and is a growing, growingly popular. They have a lot of uh, kind of success with young professionals, and they do quite quite amazing work. You know, see they kind of really study the order, and they kind of measure things, and they kind of really get an understanding of moldings, of proportioning, of lines, and they do it by hand. So there's a lot of craft work, and then projects. It's not a classicism which you know you would necessarily find derived directly from Vitruvius, but it's a really living classicism considered as a living discourse, a living reflection, learning. And some of the students' work. This is uh, uh, by uh, Anthony Fisioglu, uh, an uh, office, so a chamber of commerce. And then this kind of really exquisite project by. Um, Chris and Lee, it's in, um, uh, in, in Venice, in Scotland, a little uh, classical development on the hilltop. I don't know what the program is, but it looks really exquisite. I was, and it's all, uh, this is actually uh, com computerized drawing. Hi, Sam, how are you doing? Vicky, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, everybody, the, the panel is complete. So look at that. Look at that. Yeah, all right. So we're panelists, all complete. Unmute yourselves. Everybody else mute and the panelists, please unmute and <laughs> bravo. Next. Great. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that I was on mute when I started talking. So I think we're all here and I hope that I spotlighted everyone. Yes, I think I managed to. Um, who's in the panel? And so we can just start the discussion. And I thought maybe we can start with some general feedback or feedback and questions to Leon's talk so that we can just, while he's there, get the, um, use the opportunity to address him directly. <laughs> Does anyone have any direct question or feedback at this point? Yeah, yeah. Which? Yes, I, uh, mostly I, I, I agree with Professor Korea, but I, I don't think there is anything wrong with the prefabrication, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I I believe classical architecture invented prefabrication because uh, no blocks of stone or bricks were made on site. Uh, those those were uh, made or cut in the quarries or the Kins and uh, then then they transport the material to the site. Then then we build build the architecture with, with the prefabricated uh, materials. And uh, uh, I I said this because I I, I believe uh, new uh, new technologies help. Uh, in a great way. Uh, for instance, uh, the printing before the Renaissance uh, is one of the many factors that, that made Renaissance. The Renaissance it is, it has been. And, uh, I, and I think today, especially today, we need to apply uh, those new technologies we could to, to rebuild a great city. Uh, and, and I'm not saying uh, craftsmanship are not important because they are very important. And uh, by, by combining those with, with the new technologies, I, I, I believe that's how we could make, make a difference. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Leon, do you wanna answer that question directly or that statement? Yes, yes. The, of course there is not the single way. If you, if you build a town, there's a lot of stuff, but I wouldn't call it new technologies. You know, they've always been uh, prefabrications <clears throat> of some sort. Uh, you know, even trees, you fell a tree, you don't, it has not grown on the site where you built. But 
there's a, an, an, a fundamental distinction between vernacular and, and classism. Let's say vernacular, which is the common building of residents and working and farming, and you know, which is <coughs> traditionally uses local materials as close to the site as possible. Now, a lot of building is also what David Graeber called bullshit jobs. Uh, is a very important book called Bullshit Jobs. He is an economist who taught at the Lund School of Economics. And he, he died last year. He identified that <coughs> he analyzed what most people do. And he found that in our present world, most people's jobs are bullshit jobs. They are, in fact, slave labor. Whether you sit on a table and you know, fill in meaningless forms which can be replaced tomorrow by any number of computer and but always in life there's a lot of work which is bullshit jobs the problem is now that 99 percent of what people do is bullshit jobs whereas when you look at traditional building most of the jobs done on site or even off site are interesting they need a, a lot of skill a lot of training, seven years apprenticeship was the general to become familiar. And of course, certain things are, are always prefabricated. But building in order to, one of the problems is uh, prefabricating a brick, whether you do, do it in Terracida as, as uh, uh, Alejandro uh, projects, they do the, the, the mud bricks, they do them on site and dry them on site or whether you have a brick done in Manchester and imported to India <laughs> as ballast, because all empires always used stone as ballast. Uh, so transport often is necessary in order to return the ships, not empty like you know, Argentinian cattle was exported to France, and they would return to Argentina with stone parts, which were entire entire stone buildings in Buenos Aires, were or whatever Cordoba, were imported from France, and in the period nineteen, you look nineteen hundred, l'illustration French magazine, you see advertising for a corner building to be exported to to Argentina. All that was prefabricated. Uh, so there, there, of course, there is a gradation. Most of our building sites, for instance, the, the project in Guatemala is all concrete. Because just the, the sis seismic uh, regulations and coding, uh, you can't build traditional buildings because they wouldn't be allowed. But that is not, do we want people to work as slaves doing boring jobs all their lives? Or do we want to progress learning a job and then leaving no, learning finally becoming uh, mastering their, their skill and excel in, in their talents. And so the building sites and, and building craft allowed something like, at least in Germany, it was like uh, 39 different building crafts working different materials. Prefabrication, industrialization, so called new technologies, they are not new, they are just uh, different. Huh? Uh, they are machine uh, production, which can be tomorrow replaced. Bullshit jobs will be replaced by robots anyway, they are already. Uh, so it's, it's to let in the future only horrible jobs done by, by uh, robots, but not the good jobs. No, you don't. Why, how do you explain that? I wonder how, what's your explanation? Why, why did it come this way? Why, why do we have there's these a, useless jobs? A, there's a blind automatic a fatal development uh, throughout uh, civilization, which is not com controlled by intellect or by the heart, but which is fatal. No. What is it uh, controlled by? Uh, nobody controls it. You have to read the book of um, Patrick Wood, Technocracy, Rising, mm -hmm. te Rising. It's that <laughs> it is that system which transcends all ideologies and which mm -hmm. goes towards uh, a completely robotized and, and police state, which, you know, we don't, we won't escape here either. You have it large already in, in uh, you know, you come from China, you, 
you know how it works or doesn't work but yeah. it's a fantastic job making music is a fantastic job people are born with enormous talent if you don't train it very young it gets lost and then people become frustrated and become angry old old people <laughs> of either sex or no sex uh, so in the traditional crafts, they are a way for people to really make satisfactory. We have, and particularly our profession, is the most interesting profession in the world. To plan towns, to plan villages, to plan, you know, to plan things in locations. However ugly, you can make a beautiful thing, even with the poorest, even with the concrete. And uh, if you are obliged to do fake, because the industry works that way, to do real good building with fake industry is terribly difficult, much more difficult than if you have craft. I see Timothy, fantastic, you know all about it. <laughs> I mean, to do now a traditional building with an industry which is only used for <laughs> fake techniques, I mean, it's much more difficult than it used to be. Huh? So, uh, of course, we are not against having new techniques or mechanical techniques to take over jobs which are never pleasant, like cutting a gigantic marble marble block. I mean, just as well. You know, the new castle in, in Berlin, the reconstructed castle was enti entirely done by, the, you know, the, all the stone was cut by, by robots in a quarry near Dresden and then finished by craftsmen. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we, we are not idiots. Huh? I mean, we, we adopt techniques which are the more pleasant but it's to to save what is good about our job i mean you don't want the violinist to to be played by a robot it's fantastically pleasant to play the piano if you have talent in in, in music you need that bodily engagement with with the instrument and and with the air around you and with the live audiences so we but are pregnant. why would you why would you think these things are getting lost I mean, is there a reason? Is it's there fatal. a reason why? It's, there's no theory, there's no control. And what's happening now is that there's, uh, wh what you see, what's happening in the financial world. But before that, uh, Leo, I just want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for sharing uh, both these thoughts and the wonderful project and proposal for Washington, D.C. So beautiful that you were sharing uh, your ideas, and uh, well, lots of drawings that that I haven't seen before. And I know you've published uh, much of it in different places, and uh, but certainly in the architecture of community, we weren't we weren't especially seeing the the sketches and the and the beautiful renditions with colors and and essentially the party drawings and so forth. Um, but I wanted to comment on two things. One is about what we as architects and in our discipline. I remember Leo, you giving a lecture, it must have been 1982 here in Miami. Uh, one of the conferences, it was wonderful. I was a, a young student of architecture at the time. Um, and, and your focus was about, was on architecture. You were talking to us about architecture the whole time or more often than not. And I remember many of the professionals and professors at the time, at the end sort of just being outraged and, and you know, like, why is he telling us this? And I, and I was, uh, you know, commenting to them, but everything he's telling us is, is about how one looks at architecture, how one does architecture, how one can study architecture, um, you know, and it all made perfect sense to me, uh, you know, and, and sort of helped me actually sort of focus and make decisions as to where I was going um, in my education. And I wanna come back to that later in terms of our responsibilities to, to students in architecture um, uh, today. The, the second thing, going back to the drawings you were showing, the, the, you know, I love the fact that you were showing uh, the scale comparisons, uh, the idea of plan making, where you were showing the federal city and your proposals with Venice, uh, you know, as a plan or as a figure ground. And, Again, that goes back to what we do. I think that we're missing. So today we're missing um, that kind of that kind of drawing sensitivity, but also understanding that those are the tools that help us to 
to understand, uh, you know, both uh, and especially referential models and things from the and things from the past. So if we if we don't seriously look at, you know, the antecedents at at the referential models, if if we don't understand the tools and the kinds of drawings that we can make, you know, it, it's very difficult then to, you know, as 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 architects and urban designers, you know, to actually come up with, um, you know, with things that I that I think are great, uh, you know, like the work that you're showing us. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it for me, it 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 really is this idea of of the ensemble of I mean, you you mentioned two things at the beginning, uh, the idea of accumulation, and I know you were making the point of accumulation of wealth or accumulation of a great of a great city that brings wealth uh, to many, and that's wonderful. And in that great city, you also mentioned currently the destruction of of health and sanity in our built environment, and you know, I, to me, this these are the important things that we need to talk about when we talk about you know, the art of placemaking, we do have to come back with back to um, what are the tools that we have in hand? How, how do we learn to do this? Uh, and, and that's why I appreciate so much your talk and your lecture and why I think it's so uh, important at this time for me, obviously, uh, you know, almost 40 years later, uh, listening to this, it just makes me, sort of very happy again to uh, engage the work in, in, in that fashion. But I'll talk more about the, some of the archi direct architectural connections later, if I get the chance. We, we, we are, uh, you, Frank, and, and the people who are in this round, and you know, we are one of the rare group of professionals who really are happy with our work. I mean, to and we use all the techniques. I, I work with Yamshit Seperi, who lives in, in DC, and we do projects now, which I never dreamt it was possible to do renderings, you know, with, and that is what's the hope, I think, for a new generation who grew up with these instruments, which for us are too complex. I, I just use, you know, I, 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 I worked for two days in improving for this show, the photographs of DC <laughs> with PowerPoint, just eliminating the horrible lampposts and the horrible, you know, there's so much junk. When you look at, look at films only 50 years ago, films done in Hollywood 50 years, everything is beautiful. The cast, the women, the men, the ugly people, and the, even they are attractive, beautifully dressed. Look at my brother. I mean, look at the people surrounding there, how youth were dressed. They were incredibly happy to dress up for a book market, you know. And so there, there was a culture of, of beauty, of elegance, of urbanity, of good manners, of good speech, and of course, of good architecture was part of, of, of taking pleasure in life. And even the worst people, when they do good architecture, there's something good they do. Therefore, I say, you know, don't care about your, nobody is perfect. If you can do, a good traditional job, even for a criminal, do it because something he will leave, which is transcending his criminality. Disgusting. You know, the woke happened in architecture 70 years ago. The elimination of beauty from, from the, from our profession. And therefore, if you, if you eliminate beauty and elegance from our profession, you eliminate pleasure in your work and then life becomes flat and very uninteresting and boring and people then have to do other things to to have fun you know rather than really be 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 developing with their growing up with their profession and their skills and that's why real artists never retire and can you imagine does anyone else have a similar experience to share or explanations more, more than anything maybe Yes, um, um, yeah, I just I thoroughly enjoy um, Leon's uh, repeated use of the word pleasure. Um, I, I happen actually to be in Washington this week uh, teaching at Catholic University. Um, and uh, the conversations with 
fellow academics and students. Um, the food and drink here is pretty good too. There's a lot to enjoy, um, but also observe um, the problems uh, that Leon had mentioned at the beginning of his project and um, the gigantic scale of the mall. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incomprehensible um, to me uh, coming from a European city. Um, so I thought it was, it was really nice to hear um, to hear you speak about it. Thank you. Um, and the emphasis on um, urban decorum and civility, um, not sort of the predominance of function or traffic engineering, things like this. I mean, that is that's how we live in 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 cities. It's how we live in towns and, and villages and places which have not uh, consciously been designed by a single author as in a single moment of time, except for amazing examples like Edinburgh Newtown. Um, but have arisen to the needs of, um, of the population over a very long time. Lots of tiny little decisions. Um, so that was really good to, to, to hear that. Um, and I think lots of the things we're talking about here and some of the prompts that you'd sent Victoria about IPCC and post pandemic world and things, I think is just too big for architects. Um, and what architects need to do is champion architecture. Um, architecture is not championed, uh, certainly, the architecture that we in this room enjoy um, is extremely marginal. And on the whole, graduates of architecture courses are illiterate. So most students are not developing the language, um, all sorts of languages and lots of skills and competences that are required to defend architecture as um, an art that can promote civility and pleasure and all the things that Leon's been talking about. Um, I think we all know that, but there is something there that we can get involved with and we can adjust. And there's, there's hunger among what's wonderful about this school and the one I teach at in London is that it's not wholly um, classical. And there's obviously clearly a wonderful wholly classical school in this country. Um, and I don't mean to malign that. There are students who may not be absolutely committed to the interests that we are, um, but they want some of the knowledge. And students who are committed to the traditional classical approach need to be able to test it and to converse and to critique what they're doing in relation to a more mainstream approach. Um, and it's those conversations and those connections which will enable us perhaps to design good classical buildings using contemporary construction, the, 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 the methods that we're forced to use by um, an industrial uh, procurement system. Um, it is possible to do good uh, classical buildings um, uh, with these systems. Um, amazing classical framed, uh, steel framed structures were being built in the late 19th and early 20th century, incorporating all the same services and systems we're required to, um, to incorporate, but they were coming from a, an architectural and a building culture uh, that um, uh, uh, where there was more and more uh, common endeavor and common direction, common cultural understanding of architecture, I think, than, it, than in the, in the highly fragmented and, and fairly base uh, conversation we have now. It's very nice to hear of you because I've seen your work and that you are working in this cell of resistance, which are, there, 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 there is a lot happening and it's important to have this platform, also the prizes where people used to meet, now it's more difficult to meet, but there's an enormous amount happening also on the theoretical level. You know, that we have a system which we can explain and defend, justify really uh, with a lot of experience. And why it takes so long for this to become mainstream? I don't understand because it worked for thousands of years and we have still the, the beautiful buildings standing about, whereas the rotten, the rotten, I mean, buildings which were built with the rotten theory are already rotting everywhere. And um, so it's, it's very important that, that we get more public, uh, that something is, is happening that I always said, why don't we have a table in the White House? You know, new urbanism, somebody like Andres would be a fantastic Secretary of State for a short period because in the end it becomes boring and it's all power struggle. But uh, that at least the state which you know, sucks in so much energy and power 
at least produces something worth a while, whereas now they produce rubbish. They are basically um, promoting rubbish, bad construction, bad. And but the main thing I, I think in our discipline is making places. Is really the main object of good urbanism is to plan building sites and the right densities, because you can have the best the best urban plan. If you over densify, it's going to be destroyed. One of the most beautiful cities was the city in London, and now it's a dump because they overbuilt. And uh, rather than you know, because they are really like enormous when you build the traditional town, it becomes such an engine for added value that of course it attracts all the parasites who want to make even more money but once you go very very high the reinvesting becomes a losing game and the returns are not what what they promised so it's a system which is bound to fail and imagine manhattan is going to build that way for another two centuries when every building lot is a skyscraper. I mean, how can mature people who th are supposed to think and be intelligent sustain such a system? Whereas we know that uh, decent towns should be three floors where you can walk up pleasantly. And uh, if we have an overpopulation, we have to expand. But if you expand with dense towns, it will never occupy the surface of, the, of suburbia. So we have all the arguments speaking for us, and, but in the public platforms actually talking about Washington I showed him Tucker Carlson is the only the only newscaster who regularly talks and he recently had a talk with Andres Duani for one hour uh, otherwise all the main newcasting in Germany in France and it's all modernist huh? and so once <coughs> if those ideas were really spread we would have enormous success I mean, not that it, it pains me that we don't have enough success. I, I live comfortably. And <laughs> but you know, this should be because most people love this stuff. They love Williamsburg. They love uh, the classical buildings in Washington. Why are they offered this junk? You know? Not only to look at, but to work in. And, and it's so would just you not say it's a, Would you say it's a problem of too little communication, too little spreading of no, the word. Or... No, no, it's it's that the communication is controlled by criminals, by propaganda, by propaganda which is uh, stultifying, and and now they are their power. The fact that modernism called itself schools of architecture, they never taught architecture. They called themselves schools of architecture. They don't teach architecture. First of all, the destruction of the language, and in the end. It's the ones who make war who are making peace, you know, but people die. So it's it's very very we are, we are in the moment where the this kind of destruction of postmodern destruction of language and meaning is really working at the at the foundation, destroying the little we had as civilization, and really dissolving it for the young people. I mean, it's, it's, we had because the massacre of the Second World War was such that at least things calmed for a while. But now it's starting again. And it's very, very, I mean, architecture, you should not, you should not uh, resist any technique. Anything is good for making a good places. So I, I'm not purely, I mean, it would be nice if we could have 100% of craftsmanship, but just doesn't exist. But at least use craft for what you see. And for when I see, uh, I'm surrounded here by building sites where, where I'm staying for a while. And the noise and the unpleasure of which most builders, even in the most beautiful buildings, have now with modern techniques, so called modern techniques, it's barbaric. Whereas decent building sites, I always remember from Seaside, you know, staying there while Cisse, uh, Frank knows very well how pleasant even building sites are there. <laughs> There's no noise, just a little hammering sometimes and a bit of sawing. But so that pleasure at every level, not just at the... Re and that is why traditional architecture, traditional technology is so important, because everyone at most stages, steps of production, of selling, of buying, 
of retiring, of inventing, of drawing, of reproducing. Everybody has his pleasure. Whereas in the modernist chain, nobody has pleasure. All my modernist friends, they are frustrated. And poor now. Because their offices cost too much money, so they end up by having no pension left when they retire from the office. So, whereas classes, they, they make <laughs> they make a buck nowadays. Um, so it's very important. I mean, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Because what's life about? It's about enjoying it. And therefore, making part of this formidable nature is fantastic. You know, it's beautiful. Nothing is ugly in nature. Everything is beautiful. Speaking of nature, <laughs> speaking of nature, you, you mentioned pleasure, and I do agree that it's a very important point in architecture. But also, um, I think another point that is very important is making this nature, this planet, livable for future generations, not only for us. And it might be that we are comfortable with it, but future generations will not be unless we change something very profound about the way we go about the planet, but also um, about the built environment. So, uh, Timothy, you said that the problem of the climate change is maybe above architects, and I do see your point fully, but at the same time, architecture is contributing about 40% of the CO2, um, so the carbon <laughs> pollution. And so well, what construction is, yes, yes, construction yes. The, is the construction pollution. industry. Yes. But, yeah, I mean, my, yeah. my point is we, we have we have very little control over the means mm -hmm. of construction of the buildings we're designing for our clients. The, the client and the um, procurement context set that for us and, yeah. and we should understand it and, and, and adapt our manage our own expectations to achieve something which is um, uh, there's a coherent relationship between architectural language and tectonics. Um, some architects are able to do it. They can build in traditional ways, mostly for multi-millionaire private clients. And that's wonderful. I'd love some of that work. Um, uh, but, but that is not going to do a great deal for, for climate change. Um, it's just you know, quite often in, in, in events like this, it's like, you know, if think what can we do and, and not neglect the fact that it's, it's our professional activities in architecture and planning that we have quite, quite no abilities but within yeah. that, we need to make the most coherent ar yeah. argument. Yeah. And I don't I, feel that, that we are. Absolutely, no. And that's what I would like to uh, point the direction of the talk to. So does anyone have any idea about what traditional and classical architecture can offer in terms of sustainability? So is there, is there, well, does anyone else maybe have experiences let me, about this? Yeah? Let me start the, the ball rolling because uh, it's very important that you all read the book Bright Green Lies by Derek Jenkin, no, Derek Jensen, Liari Keith, and Max Wilbert. You read that, it's like The Long Emergency by Künstler. You, <laughs> most people don't sleep anymore because they really analyze all the all the lies which are being spread about sustainable industries or sustainable policies and they're all basically their propaganda and the new line of aggression and uh, destruction of civil society will come from the greens no we're all fake there's nothing to do with nature it's crazy so do you think there is no um, climate emergency or what is it no there is an, a mental emergency so there's no climate emergency. There's a climate emergency engineered by a colossal global propaganda of corporate interests who are going to tell you what is what is the right thing to do. And there won't be any choice. No. The problem is that the, the science is bought. There is no that we know too little about climate to make definitive political decisions. That's why I say always you know, there should be a real name of, of saving the planet. And they are just another, another form of, of monitorizing nature and exploiting nature. Bright Green Lies, it's it's fantastic book. It's very, but unfortunately, they are, they are really uh, bioethicists. They think that all civilization is biocide, is killing, killing nature and killing life which is fundamentally true that humans, uh, when they are in large numbers building 
building cities and mining mining uh, the earth are killing a lot of life that's a fact but right. traditional cultures are the ones which are the least biocide compared to uh, what we are now the scale no and when you read what is always the latest fashions architects try to save architecture again now it's post pandemic cities it's all bullshit huh? i see the symbiosis between um conservation and restoration of the natural environment and conservation and restoration of very good architecture of our heritage architecture and and trying to find you know the the embedded wisdom in that you know as you show us in your projects that that allow us to to continue to move things forward and develop and make new places and by that i mean if i like really quickly if i use one example like one of the projects that 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 i uh, sent in to you all, or I shared with Lucien, uh, which is a, a townhouse in 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 Boston's Back Bay on Beacon Street, and you know that townhouse from you know 1863 um, is is actually uh, completely sustainable and a very intelligent building because not only in terms of number of stories, and I'll say this very quickly, in terms of number of stories, in terms of accumulation and making place in terms, of, uh, in terms of making a building that's actually healthy for its occupants. At the end of the day, that building uh, uh, is, is held within a very small footprint. It has front rooms and garden rooms. The front rooms address the street and the front rooms in that case are facing uh, 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 a Southern exposure. So the fenestration is completely geared toward how it brings in light, ventilation, and so forth. The building has a core that allows for passive, uh, you know, for, for passive cooling and passive heating. And the uh, the rooms that face to the north have a kind of fenestration that deals with the uh, the cold, uh, uh, colder aspects of weather. So it's completely connected to context to place the architecture, the building itself. I haven't even told you how beautiful the building is. Hmm. It's a very healthy building because you walk, you know, it, it, you know yes, yeah. it's a four to five story building, but it gives health to the people using it. Now, in that district in Boston, all of those buildings are constantly being reused, tinkered with. Sometimes they're, you know, sometimes it's one house, sometimes it's many flats, sometimes it's dormitories for many universities. But it's such a smart building, you know. We learned so many lessons from it. But what I find, and and it's a very practical building. You can use it to, to uh, to try to do quite a bit of housing, or you can, you know, I guess use it for the rich and famous also. But so the point when I say it's practical, you know, this is what I mean. It's a it's a practical architecture that if that if understood, can be reused and studied. Now in in our at least for uh, most of us in our current uh, culture of building and the economics at play, it makes it very difficult for developers, builders, investors to, to even consider using that because most things are working contrary to it. And so I'll leave this off with the idea that that work of architecture, some people call it a building type, is actually a building type that generates um, community. It's the kind of building that would make part of the fabric that that Leon was showing in his plan for Washington. And it's a and it's a building that is exactly like the beautiful examples that you were showing in Georgetown, right? So I love that image that you presented us where we had the Capitol building and we had, you know, the row houses. We call them townhouses, but the row houses from from Georgetown. That's, absolutely beautiful, but absolutely intelligent. That that uh, photograph of the Capitol building is the most sexy <laughs> I've ever encountered, and the but the the row of of Georgetown buildings I had to I photoshopped a lot to get the real nice original shape because they are all all messed up, huh? but the contrast between the monumental and the vernacular it's so powerful. I mean, and to lose that by building too high is just and because it's unpractical, it's unecological, it's unpleasant. You know, all civilization, particularly in large numbers, are unecological. 
um, Rögen, the, the great mathematician, uh, he, he, he said there is nothing like an ecological civilization. Civilization is using uh, free energy in a one way and losing it. But at least it's the most traditional <laughs> ecology, traditional building, traditional materials used locally are the most sustainable form ever developed. And, you know, the, today we make the mistake of, of uh, distinguishing between high tech and low tech. And traditional architecture is supposed to be low tech. But high tech or low tech are the wrong category because ecological technology is what is sustainable over thousands of years. And that may well be low tech, but it's high tech as far as ecology goes. And all this, the politicians never speak about this. Why are all towns lit at four o'clock in the morning? I mean, the most seem now for 40 years, I think, what are the ecologists doing? Why don't they switch off the lights at night? In Florence, after 12 midnight, you know, they switch off half of the lights, the lanterns. It's the most sensitive thing and there's still too much light. So if you want really to save the environment, you have to be practical and use the, the oldest and simplest techniques. It's, and in a way, modernist architecture is an architecture of, it's architecture of fraud, about something missing, about something unpleasant, about something which is so out of scale that there is no way to maintain a modernist town in a long way. Because if you destroy a skyscraper, you have to build higher in order to pay for the redevelopment. No family can afford it. It's only big banking and co corporate world which can sustain such such nonsense, you know, and which destroys society. Removal of those buildings once their use is over. Yeah. The, 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 the problem is that we have a count of the, the traditional, new traditional architecture and urbanism, as the journal Alejandro's <laughs> magnificent journal is called is a counter project which we know if this is applied 100% around the world it's a better more beautiful and more acceptable and more pleasant world but that political counter the counter project on the political on the economic on the financial on the uh, on the industrial are missing what have they done i always said to my philosopher friends where is your counter project Samantha, would you like to say something? You have your hand raised. And... Sure. No, it's always so empowering and inspiring to hear Leon Carrier talking about his designs and his ideologies. And I always recommend my friends to read all those anthropomorphic little diagrams and also Anders Duwani's books, as well as um, Classical City Planning. But I have two questions on the plan for DC itself. One is more on style and the other one is on process, but I'll, I'll talk more about it, but it just shocks me or it makes me happy to see how um, much similarity that I see between Leon's proposal for DC and the readings I've been reading from, because um, I come from a school that's not entirely classicism, but um, we, we were, uh, so our chair, Anita, was writing about replacing places, which also started with the idea of trying to make a place a place. Um, and she mentioned like Peter Latt's Landschaft Park in Germany um, and how they're also right. going to the Landschaft's Park in Duisburg. Right. Yeah, Duisburg Nord in Germany and how they're also um, kind of countering the Venice chatter can approach and trying to do this retrospective and projective attitude instead of, um, reconstruction of the landscape, which really resonates with um, what DC Proposo is, and as well as a lot of thoughts on scale and um, humanism design and, you know, like sustainability. It's always being, I feel like in a human and everyone's trying to do that. Um, I feel like the major divergence happens when, when it comes to style, which I know um, deeply that classicism isn't really about a singular type of style, um, but it's really hard to explain to my friends um, in a very clear way. Uh, like I can see how Romanesque Gothic in Sicily is kind of a beautiful marriage between this like Western and the more like African, the Islamic um, idea, or sorry, the Gothic and the Romanism. But 
like normal regular people can see that and in your proposal for the bc i see more of the lineage with the western classicism and i know the obelisks are from like egypt and um there are a lot of arguments that you can make for it right like like different aesthetic styles that you have incorporated into your building design i know you definitely did but i would like to know more so i can proudly introduce the project to my friends um and also um i know the plan is very ambitious and big so have you thought about like a time frame or like a process based like 10 years 30 years because you were mentioning adding more obelisks um as time progress <laughs> but how, like can you expand more on how how you envision like this quarter happens first or next quarter happens next so that that's just more in the same kind of language or of what um my friends here are talking about so i i, I don't know i think that that's just the confusion and problems I had and yeah, I, I don't know. Could you um, enlighten me about the inclusivity of the style and um, you know process-based design? I was trying to tell them that traditional architecture has this process-based design. If if I design in uh, in Washington, I think it's it tends to be classical city because they were you know the generals and the the founding father. They were really enlightenment uh, people and the best buildings in in dc are are formidable quality in that style in the classical style the whether it's by paul Cray or i don't know but even the more abstract classicism is is still very inspiring if i work in in uh, in mexico i do mexican style if i design in china i do a chinese town or, right. or in Africa, I will do in, because there are such fantastic different styles in, in Africa and, and around the world. Wherever you go, you find within miles the signs of good architecture, of, if it's not eliminated. The right. only place where I ever worked where there was no more local style left was in Cyprus. Cyprus, as except for the Turkish part, which you are not allowed to go, has no more vernacular so we traveled with Yamshit we went to to Rodos <laughs> to other islands to find what is adequate architecture so you know when Andres does his um, uh, charrettes they go out with a few people or us too we for instance in Belgium we had three people studying the local um, the local vernacular the traditional uh, Flemish ver vernacular they do charts and models and strangely when we resigned the new people who took over took actually those uh, books and the model buildings which had been built actually by the best were done by by lucien's partner uh, colin mulhern and they continued and it's as good as any of my projects which i have under more under control so the the traditional style is not something because it's it's universal where spoken language is always something you have to acquire when you are young to be able to speak properly when i go to china i learn chinese i will always have funny accent you know um, if if i go to china i study the local vernacular i design a town somewhere i will do perfect chinese architecture but do you think america is a particularly interesting case when it comes to like a heritage style because it's hard to pinpoint like what exactly made America like all the slaves that arrived they come from like Ghana and Benin and they have their original style as well and I understand that Longfang's proposal have this like it's beautiful and we can take that as the genius Loki but I, I just find it hard to justify that as the singular genius Loki for for DC Although I would love that to happen, I think it's beautiful, but I I just can't I I don't know how to justify it hundred percent. If if you see what I'm saying, uh, America is of course a very recent uh, or modern America is a very recent civilization. And there's very little left of uh, you know indigenous Indian culture. Unfortunately, uh, the there's some adobe villages, but but is not enough clue 
know, to, to, do, to design towns because it has been very destructive uh, of, of Indian, Indian indigenous, really indigenous architecture. We know very little. Um, whereas you know, most countries where I go to, there's, there are a lot of routes in Guatemala or in Mexico or in, in Italy or wherever you, you are in Europe. There's a lot of language, architectural language established for, for generations to draw upon. If it's missing, you just invent it. Because it's the climate, it's the climate, the soil, and the altitude which define architectural good architecture, good vernacular. Because you use the materials, you protect against erosion and, and against the uh, uh, whatever the natural conditions of wind and 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 water and and climate, and you use the materials which are there, and you create. Why is the architecture of the Himalayas? and the architecture of the Sierra Nevada in Spain and of the Basque country in France, why are they similar? Because they are built in similar climate and altitude and soil. Mm -hmm. So that is what you, even the same flat roofs, you know, you find Sierra Nevada in Spain, it's the same you have in, in Tibet and, and, uh, and Nepal. Uh, there are similar techniques which have been involved from what is available in whatever altitude, you know. And for instance, the best uh, vernacular architecture in Germany or in Austria is always in the Alps because you have a lot of local wood and the craft of working wood is maintained in the mountains in Bavaria and in, and in Austria, in the Alps in Austria. Fantastic work done now. Or even in the last, in the worst period of architecture, you still have good carpentry and people who do good carpentry. So the style comes once you do, once you have acquired this technique then your personal, you are a person, from as far as you are human, you're not yet transhuman, <laughs> you're not a robot, uh, you have a unique talent. If you play the piano, or if you use wood or plaster, or if you carve stone, you have a unique way, whatever technique you learn, you have a unique way to transform that material into building or object of use, the same way that I have the only accent in the world speaking such awful English. <laughs> it's impossible to, to be different from yourself. We are unique persons and whatever we do is unique. So the worry that most artists have now to find themselves is completely ridiculous because you are yourself whether you are wanted or not. The question is how good you are you know? and in how far you you fit into your profession. And if you are not good at it, it's better to do another job. So it's um, and most traditional, you know, there are people who are good at working metal and others who are fantastic. You know, when Alejandro has his prize prizes uh, ceremonies, it's fantastic the crafts and how well they speak how articulate they are, makes architects look ridiculous. Because not only do they master their technique, but even their language. And they are unique because they know, because they have every day the pleasure, the satisfaction of doing a fantastic job. And so the worry about if I work in, I love classicism, I think it's incredibly sexy. And Henry Bacon is the best architect who has ever lived in the 20th century. Yet there is no book about him. But everything this guy touched is extraordinary. Henry Bacon, the architect of the, mm -hmm. uh, he used one hundred percent pure classicism. Yet his work, you can recognize it if you know classicism. That must be a Henry Bacon. And he he did not try to do Bacon. It's because he was so good. He couldn't help being extraordinary. I mean, look at the fountain on Dupont Circle. It's just fantastic. It's unbelievable. Um, and so it's classical art is so is really a means for individual to express uh, their individuality while being universal and being understood by everyone. I mean, look at classical theater, the way people speak classical Shakespeare 
or classical Greek companies. Just by their voice taking a role which is perfectly known, they become absolutely unique and like you never heard them. Like a real pianist who plays a piece you heard a hundred times, if you hear real a great talent, it's like you never heard it before. Because it becomes his piece, yet he hasn't added note. It's just the way, and that is the way we are, we are creatures. We are unique. We don't know who, who made us, apart from, you know, why, we, why this is such a system. It's individuality. And so to be individual, it's the least of our, of our problems. Like climate should be the least of our problems. If we do the right thing, climate is no, I mean, climate can be problems when there's, you know, there have been crises. I think what we do, the profession, artistic professions and craft professions, they are fantastically satisfying uh, jobs now. And you don't need to educate, no, uh, to wait for five generations to build paradise on earth. It's already here if we have the right profession. Um, Jas, uh, do you want to talk about this as well? Bushra and Alejandro, you haven't really spoken yet. <laughs> Maisa, ask your opinion on all of these matters. Uh, first of all, can you hear me well? Yeah. Apologies for this weird uh, <laughs> position. I'm in the school I was teaching uh, a while ago, and I could only find this place full of wires to, to connect and I speak this way. Um, I've, I've been uh, listening to this conversation and, and thinking of what it was being said about construction. Um, and it's true that construction in, somehow imposes on us a way of working nowadays because of how it is arranged. But it, it is also true that through our design, we can somehow guide construction to a particular kind of, of experience uh, in the way um, you choose details in the designs. You will not be able to impose it, but you may lead um, the work to go in certain direction. And there's no, I think there's never 100% uh, success in getting what you would like to get, but if at least you have clear that what you, you want to achieve and then to um, use always the, the, the most you can use of, of a building tradition, um, that which is still affordable and, and it, it is allowed by the many regulations and all that. If you can at least use that, then you will somehow go in the right way, even when the construction industry is against you. And then it will all, of course, depend a lot on who is the one building. And uh, work this, the same project designed in the same way can be a joy and you can, it can be a pleasure to build and can be a terrifying experience if it's in the hands of, of uh, someone who doesn't care and knows anything about building tradition. And it's, it's a, normal now that we can be uh, enjoying the work site or you can be just like cops <laughs> trying to uh, avoid uh, terrible things being done every time we leave the work site and and this is experience that um, is very telling uh, when when we work in the south of morocco where tradition is still very alive uh, is the most pleasant um, possible experience of a work site where you can, you only have to coordinate a little bit and just enjoy seeing the people doing the best because they do enjoy with their work. And every time you have the chance, being in a more formal economy or, or more informal economy, you have the chance of enjoying people who are mastering the technique. It's a totally different experience for an architect. It's just, uh, it's just a different profession. And, and it's, um, it's something that when, when you see a work site where kids can be playing there, um, because there's nothing um, threatening in the work site. 
It's just materials which are healthy and tools which are not dangerous and have hardly any dangerous machinery. I think that's fantastic. Um, that's something that probably was always so for all, all architects. And we have, le we have little by little uh, forgotten uh, that our profession was that nice <laughs> when it came to the construction part, not only in the design part, but also in the construction part. Uh, do you want to also comment? Um, Hello again, uh, everybody. It is lovely to hear your all discussion. And um, Leon, I uh, appreciate it for your presentation, especially your drawings were very uh, impressive for me. I just want to ask a question about the garden cities. Uh, um, about, the, like, I have uh, seen your essay uh, from Architecture Review 2014 about London and uh, the development of the London uh, in your uh, career and uh, your ideas about the sustainability also you had talked about uh, earlier. Um, I wanted to ask what you think about the garden cities um, and how it could be helpful for London as well, or is it possible, would it be possible? Um, yeah, that's all, thank you. Well, garden city is, is one of those terms which is a contradiction in term. <laughs> a city is not a garden and the garden is not a city. There are gar cities with gardens or cities without gardens, but the garden city is nonsense, really, I don't know one garden city except maybe a very nice, what's so-called garden city designed by um, Anoni, I think, and architects, uh, which is really making houses have gardens, but they have also, it, it's also a real urban quarter. Um, and, but the garden city has, and there's another one in Germany, maybe the Margaretenhöhe in the, uh, in Essen, which was a Krupp. But otherwise, have you visited garden cities, English garden cities? Uh, terribly, Sunlight. Terribly boring. And um, they have none of the excitement of real city. Um, because they are already suburban in scale. All the garden cities, they have a tiny center and then a lot of suburbs where you walk down the streets and all houses look the same and uh, only teeny weeny trees uh, people it looks like the english <laughs> also in like the europeans hate hate trees so the garden city is a treeless uh, uh, expanse or only tiny tiny trees whereas that's a nice thing about some or many american suburbs the very fine suburbs they have fantastic trees but then I lived for two days in in a, in such a suburb in Princeton once, and you have the lights on day and night because it's too dark. <laughs> With the the tree living in a forest is just you know not enough light to. <laughs> anyway, but you know now the the movement of new garden cities in England is just ridiculous. I mean, there now this publication just came out with these new garden cities, and it's just awful. Then no cities, just suburb, more suburb called differently. And I think what we, new urbanism, or what we offer in Europe, uh, urban, whatever you call it, it's traditional urbanism, and you have it in, in every country. You, every European country has this tradition, whether it's Hungary or Turkey or uh, Syria or even older and, and uh, or Russia, you have them everywhere. You have models which are still intact, which we can study and then uh, uh, dimension and replicate, just learn them because it's it, it's really technology of how to make cities which interests us. It's not because it's old that's interesting. It's because it's good that we are interested in. It really works. And people still get it. I mean, they appreciate it. Uh, who cares about dates? You write date on the house, and that's okay. They need historians to remember. Huh? Uh, 
the important thing is the technology which built these beautiful places this really what people like where they and traditionally when you had for instance i grew up in a town in luxembourg and we had uh, a very large garden big enough to have decorative trees and half the garden was for vegetables which was enough to grow for uh, a six family no four children and two parents which used to be the tradition binary tradition <laughs> to to have enough vegetables to eat so uh, you can have and the local market in luxembourg came from mostly grown down in the valleys there were horticultural business on the southern slopes who or who had some northern slopes who had some from the south uh, which fed enough for a city to have twice a week markets you know the first thing which grew again which which was developed in russia after uh, the soviet system collapsed were local markets because salads grow <laughs> almost overnight and if you don't forbid them markets will happen so it's a traditional traditional structures if they are not policed by state made impossible they will happen anyway because the most natural thing to do all the multifarious talents of people develop and and uh, they they find a way to sell their you know, markets you don't need to organize them you just allow them whereas a planned economy li like we have now where the big corporations go with the state they need a police you know to control pay fines if you are not you know registered and so on uh, traditional society can be relatively uh, simple to organize because it's virtually self-organized masses whereas a real free society because everyone is born with a talent and if you don't if you just guide children you find what they are good at they don't need to be told what to do because you no know, children are born with the talent and interest they ask 300 questions per day. <laughs> and then a famous psychologist, Michel Hüter, fantastic psychologist of childhood. He says, you know, the children are born with questions. They ask, 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 because it's natural to be inquisitive. They want to learn language, to do things, what their parents do, what their neighbors do, and so on. They want to learn. And then they come to school and say, shut up now answer only when you are what you are asked so it's the interruption in the last 200 years of the natural expression of and slightly guiding what everyone is good at and doing what they are most uh, most talented for is to grind them now through the same molds and so to go through like i did 15 years of schooling being bored to tears every day. The way we were taught Latin or French literature was just made even Goethe look like a bore. Where's the counter project to oppose tyranny? No, to build a society which will be really democratic. Where are the philosophers who have a project to tell us, I tried to make, to do a capital city project for Europe. And, uh, to, so that Europe, the how many countries we have a small capital city which would be unbelievably sexy incredibly interesting i mean so beautiful that nobody wants to go to venice anymore and we could do it uh, why is there is there no no possibility to do that because we don't even have a program what should go into such a capital because the thinkers the economists have not thought about this what could be a form of government which would let a society develop its talents rather than being policed into behaving like robots and being replaced tomorrow by robots. So um, just to clarify, are you saying our society is not free enough? We don't have a free enough economy. There should be less yes, policing exactly. on the economy and more competitive capitalism well, just uh, read, competing read Ayn freely. Ayn Rand uh, demonstrates you know, that uh, um, capitalism is not really capitalism because it's a large corporations which are in cahoots in 
in bed with politics and they corrupt politics. Silicon Valley, China, Washington, it's all one axis. You know, they pretend to be enemies, but no. They but is that not exactly because they have these economical interests that they are doing that? The of reason course. why they are, yes, so the reason why they are trying to influence politics, or in your opinion, they do influence them greatly, is because they capitalism. think they have the, they have the, they want the economic benefit of that. So how is it helping to make it even more um, free, um, the, well, the rate of profit even freer, if yeah, everyone is just having their self-interest? Corporations are not their power machines who accumulate more and more power and they eliminate all competition. My father was, was a craftsman. Uh, and he employed up to maximum 10 people when there's a lot of work. But he said, you cannot become craftsman because the state is in company with the big corporations. They get the big money from Marshall Plan and they destroy craftsmanship. They, they destroy independent enterprise like us. No. And um, I am one person, so I can afford sometimes not earn anything for a year or two because I have a bit of economy, because when you are alone, you spend very little, you are free. Whereas when you have an organization, you are immediately linked to bank loans, to enormous, uh, depending on the interest rates and so on. And so you become dependent on, the po on politics. And you need in the end to employ your, so I only work as consultant, which is the ideal for, and I work with independent agents. No. Um, but our society is not free at all. And that's why there, there are structures now. Be, for instance, in France, I'm on the jury to decide because a local uh, a mayor, who was also a senator, wanted a traditionally designed, I lived in Provence at the time, a traditionally designed lycée for his village. Uh, the president of the region had read my book and he liked it and he wanted me on the jury. I was on the jury for two days because I was put there by higher political power. There was no control. I don't have papers. I don't have diplomas. I don't have stamps. I don't pay insurances for my company. But for two days, we never looked at the projects, only at all the bureaucratic nonsense, which every single architect, every engineer, every secretary of an engineer had to submit to be permitted to do the competition. And that is what David Greber calls bullshit jobs. It's not only bullshit jobs, but they are useless. They prevent quality to unfold. They are of an unfree society and we live today in a corporate fascism run by anti-fascists by anti-racists who are more racist than ever. So it's, it's very strange. It's, um, it's very disturbing because it's, it's an enemy you can never grab. It's too oily. It's all speaking the right language of doing good, of saving the planet, of doing, you know, being racially, uh, whatever it's called, uh, neutral. Plus, you, lo you love Washington and I love Washington. I lived a few blocks from the Capitol. I worked on the building. To me, it was very, very dear to see any structure that I worked on maliciously attacked by a bunch of hooligans like those people are, was very painful to watch. I don't care what their ideology is. They were out, I mean, out of bounds. It was not it's acceptable. It's and not there were people who could have stopped it, and they didn't. So I hold them just as account. I think this is a good point actually to maybe open yeah. up the conversation to the wider audience. Yeah. We have a lot of people already lifting their hands and a lot of people already trying to say something. So I'll just try and um, introduce them now. So I have Alejandro Panas <laughs> who would like to say something. Alejandro, do you want to unmute yourself and just ask the question, make the contribution? Of course. Uh, I'd actually like, I, I don't know if you can hear me properly. Right, so yeah. I'd actually like to, um, there's a combination of everything that has been discussed so far because there's been a lot of different uh, subjects, right? So I want to bring it a bit back to what was mentioned before, connected to what is being mentioned today, or like right now, I mean, 
and what the people have been talking about more or less in the chat, right? Because there's been a lot of participation. And fundamentally, uh, taking it from the environmental, the economical perspective, everything that has been discussed, right? So uh, it is true that there is, as, as you mentioned, Leon, some degree of misinformation and manipulation of uh, environmental factors as they're portrayed by the media in order to create some sort of pushback towards certain decisions and certain um, policies. Uh, it certainly is used as a means of controlling information in order to achieve power. However, what has been agreed upon by generally everyone in, in the chat is that either, even if there is a certain degree of manipulation of the information, and even if all data is not exactly one-to-one -one with reality, there is an outstanding benefit to acting in such a way in which it is environmentally sustainable, in which we contribute to local economies, we use local materials, right? Um, and Timothy, uh, Mr. Smith, was actually given a perfect example, I'd say, of how this sort of, uh, the problem that you're mentioning, Leon, of greenwashing, per se, right, describing uh, an effort as environmentally conscious, although it's not, has been taking place in London by not wanting to use brick because it uses gas and it elevates uh, pollution. But at the same time, they're using materials that in the long run are less sustainable, right? And this is what you were mentioning about uh, traditional architecture being more sustainable overall, like in the long term. And perhaps we should be exploring ways in which we can demonstrate the value of traditional architecture, not just from a market demand perspective or it's more beautiful, but also overall the benefits that are being explored, uh, not just in our lifetime, but the lifetimes to come and find a way to manifest that long-term improvement in a quantitative way that can be conveyed and demonstrated so that there's a, uh, like a shift in focus and a change in mentality uh, overall in people. And there is a more sustainable way of building and architecture, which is aligned with traditional architecture because that's what ultimately uh, benefits local economies and benefits the environment the most. I was once on a jury at Yale with Glenn Murcott, who is an Australian, famous Australian architect. Modernist work very elegantly, but he only does houses. And this was supposed to be in Canada, a project for a ministry of ecology. And all the building students presented were glass and steel, <laughs> and you name it. And so after a while, he got up and wrote on the wall, the energy embedded in every single building material they used. And then another one embedded, energy embedded in brick or stone or, or wood. And it's just shocking. So, you know, a, a brick of concrete is nothing banal or a bar of aluminum which is now used anywhere is unbelievably uh, has it needs enormous energy of petrol or coal in order to you know to cook a kilo a kilo of aluminum and uh, once you have that list i once asked somebody for a cnu a congress wanted to do I had told him about it, he did a big flag with all the embedded energy, is once you, you read that, you don't need a lot of ecological talk. You just see what is, what are the materials which are intelligent to use. Because there's absolutely no comparison to synthetic, modern architecture is impossible without synthetic materials, without concrete, without steel, without uh, plastics and so on, or glue lamb, no. And all these materials, they are processed materials, which need enormous amount of, of energy, fossil energy or mostly fossil energy. And uh, so they are unecological. And once you have that list, it should be on, on every architect's table. It's very clear that metal is a very precious material which should not be spoiled. Concrete should be very carefully used only where it's absolutely necessary and steel my god it's like bronze you know it, the very very precious materials which in the past or steel was only used for high-tech armaments 
or protection, but only the privilege could use because it's very, very, you know, it's a lot of cost and energy required. Whereas now even the banalest buildings are made in plastic. Plastics are incredible energy uh, embedded in them. So I, I did a, another project for, for the Prince of Wales in Newquay for, for 10 years I worked on this and then it was taken over by uh, Robert Adam Robert Adam's office but we were required to work with a group of ecologists in order to make this a really sustainable project and uh, so I asked for the list of materials just to test them the group they all drove mini Coopers you know very smart smartly dressed young people from the British research uh, building research station column remembers I see column there <laughs> and um, they were unable to produce that list they are not interested in these matters it's a power group who are now ONGs they are everywhere and they are parasites they don't produce anything useful they cost a lot of money they fill a report, 200 pages, there was nothing in it. It was void and empty. Colin and I, we were the only ones reading this garbage. One million pound was spent for this nonsense, you know. And uh, it was useless. So it's, you know, what is ecological is very, very simple, simple to know. You don't need a lot of research. Or develop new materials, because new materials developed are always processed materials which are very, very, need a lot of petrol or gas or coal. And so you know where they go. Uh, they are precious materials which should be used sparingly. We are not against concrete out of theological reasons, but because they are materials which should be used only in extreme situations. They are precious materials and also they allow to make a nonsense, nonsense forms like architects do without that material you can't do, Frank Geary, or without steel, because it's just nonsense. And it's, it, it's literally uh, deconstructed architecture. It's it's unreal. It's just collapsing. You know, a psych psychoanalytical institute looks like the building gone crazy and so contorted in pain and <laughs> and confusion. I mean, how Thank and you. this becomes mainstream. That is what is the most. Uh, the, devastating and they now occupy not only the research groups the climate change the media that they, they are bought and corrupt people always think who corrupts me you know in the in the 70s when i spoke in italy people wondered you know who is he paying for this is he paid for by the <laughs> americans because they were all paid by moscow <laughs> because i was alone i didn't cost anything i just worked and got my money you know, for doing my work and I didn't spend with office and machines. So as independent, they still for the while there was, I don't know for how long it will be tolerated as independence. But I tell you that most of the, and you can ask, Colm can speak about it. Uh, he was witness first, <laughs> first line writ witness of, you know, and in the end, the director of the Institute he resigned because uh, the prince asked to do an, uh, a research on, because uh, they all wanted to install windmills and they thought windmills were ecological. And in the end, David Strong, he gave us a lecture on the ecology of windmills. It's all bullshit. It has nothing to do with ecology. It's gigantic high-tech industry who make enormous amounts of money in just corrupting politics. I mean, the... The windmill industry in Germany is just insane. They have windmills everywhere and they will never produce the electricity needed to, to light the country. Uh, so the, you, know, you have to really know about this and, and therefore Bright Green Lies is a very good document because it analyzes really very technically all these matters. Very interesting people, Yerry Keith. We should get oh. them involved in, but they would be against any urban. <laughs> they think all urbanism is crime against biocide, <laughs> crime against nature. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have some more things from the audience to share. So there's um, Hans Breo. 
who says, I would love to see a panel focused on sustainability and practical integration of vernacular and passive technologies that links with a lot of the questions or uh, statements from the audience who talk a lot about this sort of question, what can sustainability bring, um, bring um, what, what, sorry, what can classical and traditional architecture bring in terms of sustainability? But we've talked about that quite a bit. So I would like to just say and read out another question before we maybe go back to this uh, sustainability issue. Um, so there's a question by Christopher Fagan who um, asks Frank Martinez. And he asks, um, is there an argument for classicism and traditional building from a health standpoint? So not sustainability here, but health. Also maybe linking with a post-pandemic uh, discussion point. Frank, what do you think? Well, some of the research that that I did, you know, with other with other faculty and folks at the University of Miami and with the School of Epidemiology and Medicine. I mean, it was really to test. Um, it was to test these ideas of how the physical environment, um, from a quantitative point of view, you know affects health. We were trying to find the correlations and the and the links. And we were actually working in the or studying examples in the city of Miami in you know neighborhoods that, that are urban, not not high urbanism, but um, but that had been sort of taken into disrepair. And and so it it uh, what we did find, I mean rather than talking about the whole thing, but but we were you know, we were taking measurements on a on a lot by lot to accumulate blocks and to take that data and then actually measure it in terms of the effect it had on the street, on the public rights of way and and uh, uh, streets and thoroughfares, right? And so we did find correlations uh, where, uh, in fact, you know, the degradation of place over time, the amount of via the effect of vehicles on pedestrian movement, for example, where it was diminished, we were finding worse health outcomes where institutions were too large and there wasn't enough mixed use. We were finding negative health icons and mental health icons on the population, both the old and the young. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that based on, on that work and that work goes back a long time that, you know, we did find uh, we did find that more importantly, uh, in some of the classes that I teach at UM, uh, or in one of the classes that I teach, you know, we talk about, we, we engage the topic of social equity, and really we do have to talk about uh, health, wellness, right, and welfare. And, um, you know, the truth of the matter is that if, if you look at it from a medical and health perspective, you know, you will, you will find, uh, you know, lot, lots of the uh, lack of goodness and problems that we see in society that have to do, the, that one can study through the, through medicine and through the science of, of medicine, uh, that it does come back to, you know, that physical activity. And, and at the end of the day, in, <clears throat> in, uh, in towns and cities and the formation of neighborhoods and making places that are about pedestrian movement and that encourage walkability and that encourage Place making and social interaction, which comes back to you know Leon's um, uh, master plan and plan making and and I would argue the 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 fact that he also renders and gives us views that talk about the architecture, like in his plan for Washington D.C. That that there we can actually see and imagine or place the human body into that into the places that he's designing, right? And that in fact, um, there is a correlation between health. Uh, and I think that there's much more work and research to do in that. And it's just like an architecture, when you get down to the nitty gritty of building and what, you know, how do you find goodness in building? Not about the style or the, but, but the goodness that can come out of buildings, which we have to include a conversation on beauty and what is beautiful. And we have to come back to social issues and social equity in all of it. But I think that we, that we do need to do it comprehensively uh, and that that's very important. 
Well, for instance, if you look at the picture with uh, my brother, Rob, there is not one obese person in that group. Okay. Uh, we walked from, I went to, you know, to kindergarten, then to primary school and then to lycée and never was driven, always walked either one minute across the street to the school, uh, 20 minutes to the lycée and, and so on or to the music school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a lot of walking, just doing the normal thing, but it was never excessive bit because walking in that place was fantastically pleasant. And uh, uh, only with rain, you would you know, crossing the bridges was a bit of strain. <laughs> and, but uh, now most American children are driven always with buses around to their schools and to their to their health club and to the you no know, yeah. the amount of energy spent and also obesity uh, cultivated that way and then you have to go to the gym to work it off you no know. it's so artificial because otherwise if you live in a three-story high building you you run 20 times a day and we would just our house had three stories and the garden and we were always jumping in a four steps at a time <laughs> <laughs> up and down the stack is it's very good exercise yeah. so what happened is this mechanization of society was that's why i say it's a fatal movement it's not thought or it was pushed by uh, the oil by the oil industry to de to destroy the traditional cities there's a real plot you know to suburbanize america was was a plot by uh, started by the Rockefeller families and so on yeah. and those who, who owned the standard oil and so on mm -hmm. and uh, really to but if that project had been known the consequences the amount suburbia of space the amount of space that takes in the United States just unbelievable uh, compared in Europe it's bad enough but the United States the the and how will that survive the next crisis now that the petrol is you know uh, the the gallon is 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 as expensive as in Europe, in, in America, and and your cars, you know, they need much more petrol. Particularly if you leave, like in Florida, I remember always that number every suburban home has fourteen or thirteen cars, car journeys every day, every day, thirteen car journeys, uh, to do anything, to buy cigarettes or buy uh, buy a CD or, or you know let alone yeah. being more important things. And, and uh, you know, Leon, one of the things about the pandemic, I mean, because I have no answers for that, but the, but it was interesting, you know, at the beginning when people really couldn't go to other places, they, they couldn't get out and do all of those car trips. And they were, it was interesting that they were searching for places where they could go out and they were dependent on their bodies. And I'm only going to give one example, but in Coral Gables, uh, uh, which you know well, there's a there's a, a, a small golf course that actually uh, acts like a, uh, a kind of little central park. And so it was amazing how how families, uh, you know, and people and their yeah, children yeah, and yeah, extended yeah, families so. gravitated to that area, and they were all walking. And so it no longer became, you know, the, that just sort of recreational place, but it was a real place that people were gathering and, and could do it safely. And so all of the, uh, all of the, what they call the bunkers in golf, in the sport, you know, where, where there's sand became uh, play places for toddlers and children and families gathered around. But it was interesting because, I mean, I'm only using that as one example where people were searching for places, you know? And in some of these, in an example like that, it's, it's, an, interesting, it's an interesting place to begin with, but it was being used in a new and innovative way. And, and I think that the challenge for, for us is to be able to design these uh, places, urban places supported by obviously wonderful architecture but that not unlike where you know what you were showing us with your brother, places where uh, they're accessible uh, to 
you know, to our entire population, be they young or middle-aged or old, whether they, whether they need strollers or walkers or wheelchairs or, uh, I mean, to me, I think that is the great, that, that's where, uh, you know, current urban design and architecture, uh, we really have a responsibility to do, to, to make place. Uh, and so I think that's where, you know, that's where the challenge lies for us. Uh, but I think I, I find it almost a rule that the more people talk about sustainability, the more unsustainable it is. Because yeah. we, I don't even talk about it because it's self-evident. And it's, uh, you know, you can't win with certain people who don't want to hear. They think sustainability is a mathematical problem, is an, a problem of statistics of, uh, I don't know, of experts who know about this and that. No, we know that traditional ways would never have lasted for so long if they were not sustainable. The most sustainable possible on this planet. One, I think we are winning the arguments anyway, because the, the even Norman Foster now talks about architecture without city is useless. No city, urban, urbanism is the most important. Norman Foster, not given a shit about about these matters. We are winning the discourse, but the problem is now, and that's really where I have a problem with Prince of Wales making part of the Davos group, who for me are a bunch of criminals, and he is not. And the problem is that if our ideas, I see it now happening even with the mayor of Paris, we had the 10-minute city, Paris has now the 15-minute city. Oh, it's an innovation. It makes all the media, this talk about day and night about the 15 minute city. Now, the next step is that if the Davos group promotes this idea, you know, the Davos World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab and company, who, who, who launched the pandemic with Bill Gates and, and a bunch of criminals. If they adopt our model, you know what's going to be? with uh, digital currency, total control, cameras everywhere, is going to be the prison that we will not be allowed to walk any more than 10 minutes per day. <laughs> that we will be told what day we can spend 20 minutes. And that is the prospect which we must unfortunately face, that those ideas, because the others don't work, the petrol is now so expensive, Biden is ruining the American petrol, <laughs> petrol industry, um, is that they're going to force people to walk. But in a suburb, there is no walking. There is running for hours and hours until you get somewhere. And how to solve that? You know, is It will be only work with a highly controlled, disciplined, you can only use your car I don't know, on odd days and this and that. And all this tyranny, modern tyranny is not like a coup d'etat. It was in the past, you had tanks in the street and everyone quiet. Now it's a slow process of corrupting society to new hum humiliations never imaginable before. Modern tyranny is a farce of ridicule and intolerable uh, uh, bureaucracy which is now being put in place and it takes time to control because you know what is coming the modern bureaucracy is going to be unbelievably rigorous and and policed we have our counter project works for architecture and urbanism for the open society when you lock people up in traditional homes or in traditional towns it's a tyranny you know because the great thing about about the European city or the traditional city, which developed also in China, is that you have a space which is shared by everyone and it's free to use whenever you like and to say whatever you like. You know, the, there was a big change in, in England uh, two years ago, in September, two years ago, when a German doctor was forbidden to talk who is no? Who, who revealed the scandal about these fake vaccines and the genetic uh, horror which they are testing on humans, uh, Dr. Schöning. So they went to 
uh, with a large group of protesters against the mask wearing and the vaccination. It was two years ago in September. Uh, they went to Hyde Park Corner, where now for centuries, people on, on uh, uh, I mean, it's unbelievable, the scan Hyde Park Corner, where you could say anything now for centuries, and this guy was arrested and locked up for 24 hours. The famous German doctor who wrote the book actually on the anthrax, uh, the honor of our profession, which used to be the best profession in the world for 3000 since Babylon. <laughs> or since old Persia, you know. Uh, and now it's just, it's reduced to nothing. Flavio, who was one of the students who was also in the Brussels group, and I think he's probably here. He studied urbanism in Holland at the university for two years, got so bored. I think Lucien probably talked to him, huh? to Flavio. Anyway, he, he got interested. He looked around and he discovered us what are you doing? And we talked and he discovered that urbanism is so interesting, whereas two years at the university, you get bored to tears by those idiotic prescriptions and coding and you know, radii and whatever they, they, they learned, which has nothing to do with urbanism. It's to do with antisocial distancing. Functional zoning is, has been practiced it's anti-social distancing now for 60 years since the Charter of Athens became official. I need to go to bed. <laughs> well, uh, but can we just ask the others, uh, um, what do you feel about all of these points that Le Leon was listing? He introduced so many new points. And what is your opinion? Do you agree? Do you disagree? How do you feel about it? Timothy. <laughs> Yeah, and, and there was a comment in the in the chat about about sort of facts like that being the opportunity for traditional and classical architecture that you using using the shift in the popular debate um, as a way to get people to notice what we're doing. Um, so possibly there are opportunities in here. And something that occurred to me earlier was I didn't think well I wouldn't be on this panel um, if it weren't for the pandemic. Uh, none of us used Zoom before. Um, so while it's had some shocking lockdowns, have had some shocking results for, for health and well-being and all those sorts of things, there are some other um, kind of com advantages to communication um, and within our, our network of uh, like minds. I've met far more people over the last couple of years than I had done before participated in education and reviews and conferences and things. I've heard talks. Um, that I wouldn't have heard before. So while it would be and fabulous to give you a glass of wine after this, um, I wouldn't have been there for the glass of wine. To have to say that Bushra is leaving now. She has another assignment. So I would like to just say goodbye to her and thank you so much Bye. for being here. Thank Bye. you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you. Nice I think it's getting Bye. late actually. So I think a lot of people might be ready to leave. But before, just two things before. I, there is Alejandro and Christopher and there was Martina and she was she's not there anymore but there's a couple of people who have been raising their hand for a long time from the audience I would just like to give them the opportunity to speak before we close so um, Alejandro do you want to speak I own Bertram as well <laughs> so but Alejandro Bertram and then Christopher if you could speak and unmute yourself please I'd actually like to let uh, Christopher speak before me because he was raising, uh, raising his hand before me. So, good. <laughs> right. Um, so, civilization is still alive. So, thank you, Alejandro, for that. Um, I want to thank everyone for just having like a really open debate where we can talk about all these things without fear of being shut down or, you know, being delegitimized for our opinion. So, number one, that's really what makes me excited to come back to these conferences compared to any other organization I'm part of. Um, there's one question that's been burning on my mind and it kind of goes to what, um, what Frank was speaking to as well when it comes to health and Leon as well. When it comes to the walkable city and it keeps us young, it keeps us slim, it keeps us healthy, that we have to use our own energy and our own bodies and resources to get around. Um, one thing that I'd like to know everyone's thoughts on, or at least we can maybe meditate on it for a future debate, is about um, accessibility. You know, when it comes to the disabled or we're all gonna become elderly one day, 
we may suffer accidents, we may have kids to carry around and push. Mm -hmm. um, how do we reconcile a beautiful classical city that empowers us as individuals to get around? It doesn't infantilize us, you know, it relies on walking and biking and not on the car, but it also upholds the dignity of the disabled and those who are not as mobile as the rest of us. Um, that's kind of a complicated one, but it comes from conclude or continue. I'm going to say continue for a minute. And we both love living in big cities where we can walk around and we don't have to take car. We don't have to own a car, but she also spent, she's not here, so I can share this. She spent years um, taking care of a very close family member who had, you know, health issues and was bound to a wheelchair and it was kind of a terminal thing. And so that completely changed her outlook on this idea of accessibility versus walkability. So I think that's something that is traditionalists and classicists, we sometimes take both sides on and something maybe to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bertrand, do you want to maybe just answer that and ask your question as well? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that right now, but thank you. <laughs> maybe I'll think about it a bit. Um, what I wanted to bring up is that we also have to think about ownership structures more because I think that's such a huge issue in so many cities across the world because when you have like hedge funds and uh, big block investors, uh, you will always get uh, very faceless, bland uh, structures, what we observe in Berlin. And when you foster individual ownership or uh, leasing associations, leasehold, uh, housing associations that are associated with the city for at least 50 years, uh, that brings up whole different results. And uh, what I observed in Berlin and all around Germany, uh, we are in the, uh, is that if you change the ownership structure, you change the building culture by lot margin. And this is precisely what we foster in the old town core of Berlin. Uh, if you check out Berlin uh, around Alexanderplatz, around the rebuilt palace, you will see that there is almost nothing left of the medieval heart of Berlin. Even most Berliners don't have a clue that it actually had something like a medieval uh, old town heart at its core, which is super funny to me. But yeah, uh, what you can see obviously doesn't exist for most people. Uh, but now we get this chance to actually reinstall this historical heart. And the beautiful thing is that uh, we have some. Uh, support from the new mayor of Berlin, uh, Franziska Giffey. Uh, we just had two walks with her to have some sightseeing in the old town core of Berlin. And it was really funny because she was like, oh yeah, yeah, the, the new stuff from GDR times, from communist times is pretty ugly. And oh, wow, we have some old buildings here. They, they are much more beautiful. And we should have more of these. <laughs> so... We, we got her on, on our sides by just guiding her around. And um, with all the dystopian and um, yeah, kind of fighting vibes uh, we, we had uh, in the past decade, I think we should look more to cooperate, uh, to cooperate with decision makers. Uh, since what I observed in politics for quite a while now, if you dare to actually talk to them and to understand their points and to really empathize and to uh, feel a connection with those people uh, who are making decisions, you will experience they are open to other solutions and they are open to actually change something. It's just that you should never assume they are some kind of enemy. If you assume they are your friends and will cooperate with you, 
we come to whole different solutions. And what we observe in Berlin now is that once we got all the politicians and investors on our side, we are supported a lot actually. And that's the same that happened in Sweden. I mean, the, the media now is very much in favor of traditional architecture there. When you look at the big national newspapers in Sweden, and also the radio stations and TV stations, uh, they changed their opinion in favor of traditional and classical buildings. And they did that by the initiative of citizens, which are uh, cooperating via Architur um, Orbit by the uprising movement. And that's a beautiful thing to observe. If you realize it's possible to change the public opinion and to change the way decision makers operate, if you realize we can all do that and we should attempt and we should um, have the better arguments and we should lead with beautiful emotions. We need to stop the fight. All I'm hearing from both modernist and, and classical movements for years and years now is that we have to fight the other to get our arguments through. And that never works out, in my opinion. I think we have to cooperate and have to find common ground. And then you will find solutions. Just today, I was visiting one of the winning architecture offices uh, that are uh, planning the new old town core of Berlin. And they are doing a very classical approach, actually. And they are one of two winners of the competition. And they are famed for classical designs. And the oh, other, they, they are called Bernd Albers. Oh, yeah. uh, Silvia Malkovati uh, is uh, leading the office currently. And it's beautiful. And they are also doing a research project how to uh, translate the 19th century industrialized uh, beautiful buildings into nowadays language and how to do that for current investors. This can be a beautiful uh, basic research project that can be used throughout Europe and maybe throughout the world. And there are so many great approaches to improve the situation everywhere. Uh, just check out the, the Facebook group, uh, Michael Diamand uh, Diamand and, and me and uh, Jorge are leading uh, the new traditional architecture group. There are so many beautiful examples around the world. And we have to learn from best practice. We have to learn from case studies. And what I also think is that we have to market, market ourselves better. To use, to use the vocabulary of uh, modern movements like sustainability, aliveness, variety, diversity, ecological, whatever, to weave those words into our marketing approaches and to be a bit more modern, to, to dare to be a bit more contemporary, to get our points across. Because when we dare that, instead of trying to fight it, uh, people see our point much better. If we talk about history all the time, they are like, yeah, okay, that, that was history, but it's not the present. Talk about the present, please. They are saying that in different ways, but I think this is the way to go. We need to take it to the present. Thank you. Thank you. So what is your view on counter projects? And I mean, those are not looking back at history. Those are actual projects and propositions. Do you, do you see a value in those? I absolutely do. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, it is how to do it. Um, often I have the feeling it's done in this vibe of fighting something and in the vibe of fighting what is there currently or fighting uh, other designs that are uh, putting uh, that are put out. And we have to take a different approach. Like in Berlin, we have a very, very successful uh, classical architect who's called Sebastian Trese, uh, who last year won the Driehaus Prize. I um, nominated we, him. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and it was a great choice. And we also have uh, Tobias Nöfer. And both these architects are um, 
renowned for being very friendly uh, towards the local uh, um, bureaucracy and the local investors and just choose the approach of cooperation. And this way they get so many projects approved, uh, it's much easier for them choosing this way of love and connection uh, to actually be successful instead of fighting something. Because uh, whenever I see classical architects fighting, they don't get their point across and they don't get anything built. Uh, this is a reality in Germany. I can't speak for all of the world, but I think it can be similar pretty much everywhere. And this is my message. Um, choose love, choose understanding, and just talk to people. Actually talk to people and listen to them. You will experience that most people are on our on our side of the river and will choose classical and traditional when they understand it's perfectly doable today and it can be done easily. Yeah, I think that sometimes it's also the prejudice that people think classical is much more expensive because it has uh, sometimes a elite connotation. I think a lot of the, the problems we are talking about kind of can be boiled down to prejudice as well you know we say something and everyone immediately thinks ah you're one of these people even in this panel you know we kind of we we work the way we are thinking we are just working with what we know already so we will project whatever we think and if someone if someone is saying an opinion that is not ours we kind of say oh, it's, it's not mine so i i don't I, i'm against that i think uh, to have a more open ear uh, is maybe one of the things you were saying already, but that is maybe something we could highlight. Exactly, <laughs> I don't want exactly. to take more screen space, so I'm going to just hand over the attention to Alejandro, <laughs> who has been raising his hand for a while again. Yeah, uh, well, basically, um, I'm actually thankful that I was a third one here because I'm going to build up upon what Christopher and Bertrand just said. Um, so I actually do see a lot of common points here and something that you mentioned very early on in your intervention Bertram and overall what Christopher was talking about is um, so one of the main problems I, I think is affecting why traditional architecture hasn't been so healthy as of late is a crematistic approach that people tend to have they tend to obsess over profit as a main focus of architecture especially when a vast majority of architectural projects are developed by uh, real estate companies that own, in the case of Germany, I think it's like 60% of all buildings are owned by a single a real estate company. There was a controversy not so long ago about that. Um, and when it happens to come down to that, usually the focus when building a new building is just making the most profit. And that usually deters from the other objectives, such as Christopher Fagan mentioned, uh, the health and the inclusion of the people that are disabled in urban planning. Or for instance, something that you mentioned, Bertram, if people start building their own buildings, then there is a primary concern to pass that building down to future generations, to consider it something that is their own, rather than something they're just gonna buy and sell in 30 years. So there's a greater concern for how it's built, for the implications of health, of uh, things like walkability, uh, supporting local businesses, all those different things need to take center stage. And we need to talk with people, as you said, Bertram, and as you said, Victoria, uh, find a common ground because usually people have similar objectives, just different means to achieve those objectives. And if we can harmonize those means and we can find a way in, wi in which this person and this person and we get the same goal across um, or, or get their own objectives across by building in a particular way, then we will have an ultimately a result that will be more beneficial than what we're having right now. Finding a common set of values that we can strive towards that go beyond just profit and that actually take into consideration the interests of the stakeholders, the people that are uh, living in the city, the people that will use a city. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. This whole problem of the corrupted interests of of a lot of stakeholders within the planning process. <laughs> it's 
Bertram, are you on purpose uh, raising your hand again? Oh no, you have unraised it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, going forward, um, do people want to go into breakout rooms and just have a open conversation or how do we feel? Do we want to keep going as a panel or what was the general opinion here? So it would be interesting to uh, just update uh, the people who are still around to what's going to happen tomorrow because we have been talking about health and well-being. So tomorrow we'll be really, really dedicated to uh, you know the issues of uh, you know mental and physical well-being and also the effects how much the importance of doing things in a, as an embodied mind. So with your hands and being involved physically with the world you're inhabiting. So be, taking part of the making and the crafting of the world we inhabit and not letting only the experts and the professionals do it, but just being part of it. So there will be a lot of very interesting stuff tomorrow. And then uh, on the third day, well, you know, Bob Adam and there will be a lot of people from organizations, you know, uh, grassroots organization and they kind of Less, uh, as they all mentioned, there's so much going on. Uh, but what's really strange is that there's a lot of things going on, and it's mostly non governmental organization, it's mostly grassroots uh, organization, it's mostly uh, spontaneous uh, citizens' movement, and the uh, universities are shying away from it, institutions are shying away from it, cities are shying away from it, but I think it's a kind of, we are at a turning point, so I think that we kind of, you know, that will probably not continue this way. I, I think we are really at a turning point and there will be major changes which will happen also academically. And I think like Tim's class, for example, in the beginning of the little niche, a little, I don't know, Tim is now busy, I wanted to ask him if it was a little <laughs> anarchy. Tim, this year, Tim. I... Oh, sorry, he's kind of muted. Anyway, but I think they no. were starting. They were starting. Okay, yeah, thank you. No, I just want to say two things. I think so. Leon mentioned earlier he has to go soon, and Timothy also has to go soon. So I think we need to kind of think about the people who have to say goodbye at some point. Okay. <laughs> I say I say goodbye now. <laughs> and wish you, wish you thank luck. you very very much for being here today. Bye bye, Leon. So nice Leon, Leon in Luxembourg, I would say good news, Leon. Good news. Good news. Good news. Good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, bye -bye. Leon. Thank you. And thank you, Timothy, as well. Thanks. I don't know how to say it in Cockney, so. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Tim. Take care. Bye. You know, Victoria, I'd just like to say the, I mean, as a closing thought on my end, the Yes. You know, um, I mean, Christopher, Bertram, Alejandro, the, you know, the, the, conver the, the, the conversation there at the end, I mean, I love it. It's very positive and it's true what Lucien is saying that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these topics are actually gonna be part of tomorrow. Uh, I mean, with, with reference to social equity and accessibility, uh, I mean, that, that was part of what I was saying earlier, that that's our challenge in terms of uh, both urbanism and architecture. Um, and and I, I do think that we need to take it very seriously. And then uh, yes. one thing that I'll say, even though Leon isn't with us now, but uh, with uh, uh, in the next series of lectures and certainly at the end with Andres Duani, I mean, I, I remember, uh, you know, I remember in the mid 80s and early 90s with the kind of urban work that was being done. And um, uh, Andres uh, and Elizabeth Plater-Zeiberg always took a very positive uh, approach in their interactions um, um, with the projects and, and with the, 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 uh, the go government, having to do with government and political issues and you know, bringing in the community and, uh, and, it, and and all the comments now made me remember that, you know, in, in, in the world of, in the educational institutions, we weren't paying a lot of attention. And, uh, 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 but, but these early, you know, urbanists and new urbanists were really thinking about it and engaging that way. And a lot of time has elapsed since uh, 
And we're, we're in a place now where I feel like, you know, and I, we're not gonna talk about this now, but it could probably continue tomorrow with, you know, the role of, yeah. of, 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 of educational institutions and to, um, to really bring back, uh, really, this just goes back to Leon, you know, the art of placemaking. And, yeah. you know, we're really good at many other arts, uh, including, and, you know, Leon would immediately react to this, right? Systems of communication like Zoom and others, right? But so, I mean, we see how those are constantly advancing. I think, you know, uh, we're, we're here. We have to take very seriously the art of placemaking. And yes, that's, absolutely. That's what I see in this group. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Um, I think I want to also link back. I was kind of cutting to Lucien, but what he was saying was really important that we have this tomorrow panel talking about health and new science and the perception about architecture. So a lot of the issues raised today will be coming up tomorrow again. And I know that this panel is taking, I mean, it's going on because we have a good conversation going and there's, there's so many things to be said. And I know that there are a lot of people in the audience who didn't get the chance to speak and not all of their questions were read out. And I'm really sorry for that. But um, I really would like to emphasize what Lucien was saying. So tomorrow is another panel, another chance. And I would hope that people can come back tomorrow and maybe repeat their question, even if it's annoying. <laughs> Sorry, but we really just didn't get around to ask all of the questions. And otherwise, just um, just yeah, keep keep um, yeah, keep an eye open for the other tag days that are coming up and um, the other panels that are coming up. I think we have to kind of wrap it up quite soon or at least go into the breakout room so that we just have a free conversation where everyone can participate who still wants to. So, um, Lucien, do you think we can do that now? No, I mean, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, personally, I would prefer to wrap it up now and because I wrap think it we, up. Okay. Yeah, I think we have to also because it's kind of four days, so it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, we're yeah, trying to discuss not, not everything use it up now. all in one day. I think that's a good yeah. idea. Um, <laughs> but we have tomorrow after we have tomorrow after the panel a movie, and then the day after we also have a movie. Um, then we have the Sunday night, um, and uh, I, I, I just want to say how much I appreciate not only what was being said, but also the tolerance of the group. Um, because I, I am proud to be part of a group that, that straddles all the political spectrum and not you know just holds on to one side. And a, a group that straddles all the architectural styles, not just one. And uh, that does have an understanding of all the cultures in the world and uh, not, you know, not just one. Um, so I'm really, really so proud um, of all of you. Uh, I want to live in a world that you inhabit. And uh, thank you very, very much for, for being here. Um, we'll continue tomorrow with the, um, this is something that was raised several times. And I think it's a really important question is how I, I, I love science. I love that kind of uh, cause effect stuff, F equals MA, that we get out of science. Um, clearly has nothing to do with cause and effect the way we were talking today. What is cause and effect in life and politics and art and so on and so forth. But in science, you can measure it. And it's very useful. You know, it, it, We wouldn't be here without some kind of science and actually a lot of science. And uh, there's no way I'm throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater just because it was, uh, you know, not my ideology that, that originated some, some notion that I can actually use like Zoom. So I'm very happy for this. And uh, we're going to be talking about seeing ways that we can maybe get the scientists really push them to the wall to uh, define topics for research so that we can ultimately determine that manual construction is good for the individual, for the society, for society and for the planet. We know it is intuitively, but how do we actually go, go out and prove it? 
So I that's going to be tomorrow's thing. And don't forget that the overall arch of this whole thing is don't tell me anything I could have heard before COVID. And uh, the whole notion of the fifth recall to order that Leon probably put down the first, you know, the first tent peg in that one with his book, Architecture of Community, um, that uh, uh, Andres on Sunday is going to be talking about his heterodoxia architectorica or whatever it's called, um, which we've been waiting for for 10 years at least, if not 20. And, um, and then, uh, you know, not to uh, push our own agenda at the CPI, but, you know, many of the answers to the questions raised are actually found or, uh, or referred to in uh, the Art of Classic Planning. So uh, if you have a copy of it and you don't have a sticker, you know, a book plate, send me your address. Anything I can do to help you wherever you are and doing the right things. Um, um, in your neighborhoods, in your communities, uh, let us know at the Institute. If you want to continue this conversation, um, we're starting a subscribers list on the, on the CPI website, which I hope to convert into a, a replacement for the Facebook pages that we have, because that's not a reliable platform. And also, um, to uh, as an upgrade to the Tradarc list serve and the ProOrb list serve and so on and so forth, so that we have a, a genuinely unaffiliated place. You can say whatever you want. And nobody's going to tell you you're a bad person. Um, also, also final comments. Here. Final comments. A round of final comments. Can I make one last request here for petition? Sure. Um, the last year when we did this, I really enjoyed the comment section, you know, just the thread of the chat that's going publicly. And um, it would be great if we could save that or have a copy of that, because there's a lot of stuff there to dive into that kind of has a life of its own. I'm glad you mentioned that. I do believe we are recording everything and we're getting the chat with it and the TTL with it or whatever it's called, VTT, I forget. Uh, we're getting all the all these inputs so uh, the, and the transcripts of the of the of the uh, of the actual conversations as well last year we couldn't we didn't have what it took to turn it into a book but we did put together a small uh, i don't know if you've ever seen it but a small thing from last year that documented who spoke and roughly what people said this year um, we are going to have that at least again, and we need help with the continuing education units and processing them because that is, you know, that's the ultimate, um, uh, that's really the ultimate, um, um, what was the, the word that, you know, the, 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 you know, putting people down, you know, I have a PhD in architecture, and I still had to go and, and listen to 24 hours about windows and caulking. Um, for my professional um, certification. Um, and, I, and I learned a lot about windows and caulking, especially that it's all a, it's a bunch of hooey and we're better off with single, single glazed uh, windows and shutters at the end and curtains, don't forget the curtains. So <clears throat> thank you very much for being here. I have thought a lot about the cause and effect stuff that was really the central conversation and I will speak to that mostly on Sunday after the you know towards the end of the, the all the sessions if anybody wants to hear thank you for being here and I'm uh, I'm uh, inviting a round of final comments uh, whoever wants to um, make a final comment say it and and um, get off uh, you know uh, you know it's open mic say whatever you want to say and leave, and so we'll have the last, you know, the last person standing will have the last word. It's a hard one, huh? This year, you were just saying something. I was, uh, I was trying to say something. <clears throat> it's not that I'm not succeeding in saying something, but, uh, and uh, <clears throat> no, so I, would, I wanted to quickly, 
follow, follow up on something which has been said before about science. And I know that tomorrow will be so interesting because I got in touch with Nikos Salingaros because I was asking him, you know, modernist architects and the constructivists, they were always referring to science, to chaos theory, to complexity theory. And so I asked Nikos, what do you what do you really think? Why are they always using it? But they never can explain it because when you look at their buildings and they have a they have like a parallel scientific, you know, uh, narrative, which doesn't fit with what they do really. And then and that's how I got to know Nikos, because Nikos really I touched him on the on the, a fertile ground and he brought in this whole mathematical and scientific arguments in some way saying what we are talking about now. And on the other hand, what I also, also noticed, I mean, I don't think that we need, because when we were teaching the summer school in Brussels, uh, Victoria, myself, and we were just saying, you know, you have so many incredible arguments for climate, for environment, for beauty and everything, but nobody's following them. Nobody's kind of listening to them. Nobody's doing anything. And so we kind of said in some way when, because a lot of these rational arguments are completely detached from our emotional or our kind of immediate experience. So it, it doesn't have a, res a resonance, there's no resonance. So we were kind of saying in some way, the only thing which can save the world is not this argument, it's really like poetry. It's poetry, it's kind of emotion, and it's the stuff we just, now measure so we we don't need to measure it because we feel it but you know you need to have facts and arguments and data like they say and and now science can measure all of that so and what happens and that's also what in some way goes in um, to what alejandro said and also what uh, bertram bartel said is this this war between the ancient and the new, the moderns and the Asian is kind of becoming ridiculous, you know. So we don't need the war to continue because we can have a lot of common ground and you will meet tomorrow people who are not traditionalists and they are not classicists, but they kind of agree with us on a lot of things. So we kind of start having a much broader community to talk about these things. And we need we need a larger community to, you know, to make a better to make a better world so that's something one last thing i want to say and it's one of the things we wanted to offer because i know that there are many many young professionals because now that's a, that's so really amazing for example the tech in in the united kingdom the traditional architectural group in united kingdom most of the people are young people they're young people professionals and there are people who come either from kingston or they are self-taught or people who have an interest in traditional and classical architecture. And so we wanted to talk about the summer programs, which are now offered in many, many parts on traditional architecture, because the schools, the, the institutions don't teach what people want to learn about, but there are other places where you can learn it. So there is the Classical Planning Institute, but there are summer programs from various, from INPA, from um, in various places of the world. So, we want to talk about that and give list a little bit all the possibilities you have to learn about classicism, traditional architecture out of the mainstream, out of the, in a kind of more grassroots and a more natural setting where also, and that's my last thing, I think what I really liked about what we have been talking throughout this evening is the pleasure we have doing what we do, the pleasure of doing architecture, the pleasure of designing, the pleasure of working with people who are interested, the pleasure of teaching. So just what really motivates us learning is really enjoying it. So the enjoyment. And I think also Nier, when he was setting this up, he said, you have to have fun. So I think his idea, the fun principle is really important. Responsibility, not only yeah. fun, not only for our own sake, we have to also oh, be I'm, I'm, I'm a bad boy. I mean, I'm really, really sorry. I just want to see the alcohol and then I really don't can't care about anything else. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, talking about love before. That was Bertram. Oh, Bertram, Bertram. Bertram, yeah. There are only two emotions out there. There's love and there's fear. And 
the when fear enters the picture, it becomes a motivator and a confuser. And that is very much what's going on now in, in all parts of the world. We are in an era that is dominated by fear in ways that it hadn't been before, I think. Times in history which, which were not dominated by fear were very few. It doesn't mean that bad stuff didn't happen in those periods, but it does mean that better thinking did occur in those times overall. I'm reading about the Middle Ages right now. And all I can tell you is we've been there before. Don't worry about it. It's ridiculous. The only thing that's left to do for reasonable people is to do the right thing in your daily life, in your social life, in your community life, and in your professional life. And that's what we're trying to do. Just try to do the right thing, thinking of the most good for the most people, really. And uh, not being afraid of offending, because you can't you can't live a life out of fear of offense. So, um, Lazarus, Lazarus, I see you have your hand right, right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, no, I just wanted to return to that argument about the scientific um, argument. Before we get to that, I I think we can. Um, score a lot of points philosophically. Uh, modernist architecture was essentially based on Adolf Loos's ornament and crime, and then secondly, Le Corbusier's um, towards a new architecture, both of which make arguments that are completely arbitrary, completely false. And if you just point these out, then the whole thing philosophically collapses. It, it is, you know, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't have ornaments on buildings. The, the second approach that they, the modernists took was that because we want to build a brave new world, we need to destroy the old world completely, as opposed to critically examine what was the old world, or as the case was the Ecole de Beaux-Arts school of thinking at the time, and seeing, well, you know, some things are right, some things are wrong, let's examine them, let's figure out which ones we want to keep and then move on. Thank you. I think for me, it's also getting late, so I would appreciate it if we would really, I th I love that last point. I'm just saying maybe we just say our future points <laughs> fast or, <laughs> or there are no future Yeah, let, let's just uh, convene tomorrow. Does anybody want yes. to say a final, final word? 30 second comments. Uh, Ulrich, uh, you are, you have, no, you didn't raise your hand. Sorry, it's an applause sign. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I mistook and, you. Uh, Chris Sorry. Fagan, can you send me your email, please, here in the chat window? Good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today and being so patient as well. Thank, thank you, Victoria, for moderating and looking forward to seeing folks. In the next few days. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a real, real honor to have you on, on the panel and be in your company for so long. Really an honor. Thank you. I hope to see a lot of you then tomorrow and the next in the next three days. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye bye. Hello, Bill. How are you? Bill Westfall, how are you?
helm. This looks like the um, the ultimate hardcore. <clears throat> If you do want to um, speak a few more minutes uh, before we shut down entirely, uh, unmute and uh, let's uh, let's have you say uh, whatever you wish us to hear. This is kind of like, uh, hey Bertram, uh, this is kind of like uh, the people schmoozing at the back of the of the auditorium, you know, in the lobby <laughs> outside. Yeah, actually, that's what I love about conferences uh, when you have those yeah. uh, groups of of just a few people getting deeper on some topics and leaving this general approach uh, that always brings up some very interesting insights. Uh, um, by yeah. the way, the people who are here right now, Bill Westfall, Mikibose, Arureza, um, to name a few, uh, Mateus, Luke, uh, uh, and uh, John Massengale, uh, Tim Wells, uh, Jadine. Um, I think, you know, um, thanks all for for being around and then you know being part of the the world that, that i inhabit if you can actually hear me and it's not just uh, you walked away from your computer and uh and uh i'm back from lunch oh what did you have uh, nothing spectacular oh that's good it was um, it was serviceable, not necessarily. What do you think of uh, what do you think of the conversation? <clears throat> Does everybody um, know Professor Bill Westfall? I was no. very impressed by the number of people who checked in. You, I, at one point, you had what 187, I think. Yeah, we had a good crowd. That's that's an impressive number, and they were from everywhere. It's really. And no. I was, Thank you. it's always good to hear Leo. Leo, um, Leo mentioned that it was Jack Robertson who brought him to the, to the States and um, had him at the University of Virginia. It would have been 1982, which was the first year that I taught there. And it was a talk that Leo gave to the school as a whole that was very important to me for coming to understand architecture and the history of architecture and so on. I had been drawn to UVA from Chicago that I loved for its architecture. But when I was down at UVA and the first time I saw it, <clears throat> I said, I've got to get here. <clears throat> and luckily, me. and I was there for 16 years before I went to Notre Dame. So it was good to hear Leo. I saw his show, his exhibition in Washington and I didn't hear him, of Washington, but I didn't hear him <clears throat> gloating over the fact that when the show was on exhibition, there was a tremendous rainfall in Virginia and it washed down the Potomac and it flooded many of the areas that he showed flooded as part of his lakes in, in uh, Washington. And he was very pleased with, with that. Very pleased. Uh, yeah, I remember the flood. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, we'll see what, see what happens tomorrow. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much for being there. You know, um, it's good to see you in good health as well. We haven't spoken in quite a long time. But it's only because uh, I was busy with uh, Lucienne and Victoria setting this thing up, and it's been overwhelming. So it's awesome to see you and everybody else here. Well, the, great the, to see you. The good work that you put into it showed up today. Well, thank, thank you. you. That's very kind of you to say. I'm going to start crying in a moment. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm not so much kidding either. <laughs> okay. All right. Till tomorrow. Uh, till tomorrow. Mike, we wanted you on one of the panels. We didn't have you. Yeah, it's all right. She can't hear. Alireza, are you there? How about Patrick? He looks busy. Uh, Beltram, we we uh, we need a little one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, as we move forward. Have you been speaking with Ruben Hansen and uh, Millie Main? Not yet. Okay, well, you will probably soon. Feel feel free to forward them if it's a great. They, they'll be on Sunday, and then mm -hmm. I will. Um, do so. John, are, John Massengale, are you still here? Assume that everybody who is here is actually not listening and that they are here by accident, except for us too, Bertram. <laughs> yeah, that happens quite a lot on these. And I'm uh, also leaving uh, because in 10 minutes I have uh, uh, some visitors over. But okay, it was a beautiful, hi. beautiful conference uh, opening. Thank you.